Uh, I wanted to start by thanking Nicolas Hupke for the invitation to the conference. Uh, and uh, when he originally wrote to me, I wrote back saying, well, you know, um, actually, Nicolas, you may not have noticed in the a decade and a half that we've known one another, but I don't work on Blumenbach. And he said, well, that's all right. You know, just work on something that you've already addressed in your work on French natural history. Um, and I thought, okay, well, that's easy. You know, I'll do something that I've already looked at. So then, of course, I went off and ended up doing research for a completely new paper, which builds a little bit on my earlier work, but it's um, essentially based on um, materials that have been digitized. And it struck me that I come to the conference really as somebody who's not the head of one of these big digitization projects, but rather, I suppose, an end user, somebody who makes use of the materials that have been digitized. And I was very struck by the extent to which that process has transformed the experience of research and the sorts of output that one can produce in the time available. Uh, and uh, it's quite striking that it's possible to do so much more than when I was doing research for my original publication on late, nine, late 18th century French natural history uh, some decades ago. I won't tell you how many decades ago. Um, so during the 1790s, Europe experienced one of the most comprehensive reorganizations of natural history specimens of all time. And it was centered on Paris. It occurred in two waves. First of all, with respect to the uh, tremendous uh, uh, confiscation process of the specimens belonging to emigrants. That means nobles, for example, who'd left the country, dispossessed uh, religious orders, clergymen, and also financiers. And secondly, there was a second wave in which this process turned outwards. Thank you. I'm just, yeah. It's this one. There's a process in which this turned outwards and under the Republican army, a succession of co uh, collections in different countries that were conquered by the French were taken over and swallowed up by the French Republican armies. And there were two sets of bodies involved in this. The first was a body called the Comité d'Aliénation in 1791, which is when the process begins. And it's basically about absorbing the wealth of the emigrants into the wealth of the French nation. Uh, but the peak period is really between 1793 and 1798 when a body called the Commission Temporaire des Arts was founded in order to sort through, inventorize, and pack up collections of the objects of the sciences and arts that were to be found in the conquered terrains. And this gives you a sense of this process occurring in Rome in 1797, when carts of specimens were trundling back in a long, long convoy across Europe back to Paris. Now, the scale of the endeavor was absolutely massive. Over a million natural history specimens were moved, worth many millions of francs. And it was also coextensive with French military dominance within Europe. And with the fall of the French Empire uh, in 1814 to 16, many collections were reinstated in response to representations made by returning nobles and rulers to the French crown, although I hasten to add not all. But for the 20-year period between 1794 and 1814, the material culture of natural history in France was oriented about the axis of the new state and its agenda of general public instruction. Now, several historians, including myself, have written about this interesting process and the politics of natural history that were fed, that fed into and were constructed by it. And the most famous treatment is one by Cecil J. Gould called Trophies of Conquest which dates back to the 1960s. And it's a work which highlights that the translated objects were at once objects of knowledge and objects of military victory. Now, Gould paid very little attention to natural history, but contemporary illustrations clearly show that naturalia were among the objects brought back to Paris and paraded 
on the Champ de Mars, and this is a very militarised site. This is, in fact, the military school, and there's a big parade ground in front of it, and every time the conquering armies come back, they have a sort of military display. So this would have been a place where you also would have gone to see soldiers drilling and things of this sort. Now, if you just have a look, um, <coughs> you can see here camels, okay? Battery and camels. Um, and these get picked up in visual culture. So this is from an account of the menagerie at the Museum d'Histoire Naturelle. Um, and they even make it onto plates. I'm sorry that the reproduction is of poor quality. I have to get a better copy. But you can just about see um, that these are Bactrian camels leading, uh, being led into their final resting place at the Museum d'Histoire Naturelle. So these moving monuments, whether living or dead, served the purpose of patriotic display, but also of the production of scientific knowledge and even became part of domestic material culture. So you could eat your dinner off battery and camels if you wanted. <laughs> the confiscated objects were reorganized into teaching collections for the new École Centrale, the central schools founded in 1795. So we can reinterpret the relationship that Gould identified between nationalism and collecting the culture of monument can be, uh, as it were, in the light of work on global and transnational history, actor network theory, and object biographies, but also in the light of the history of material culture and consumption. How did the commissioners conciliate the specimen's financial, scientific, aesthetic, and didactic registers of value? The Republican process of inventorizing forced individuals to make explicit criteria of signification for specimens and collections, which otherwise would have remained tacit. And here we can identify some interesting continuities and transformations. Most of the specimens ended up being processed within the newly founded national museums, established to educate Republicans through spectacle, and for our purposes today, the most important was the Museum d'Histoire Naturelle, founded in 1793 from the old royal natural history collection, the Jardin du Roi. And recent work on natural philosophy in the 18th century has explored the market for public scientific practice with regard to instruments and demonstrations, but very little attention by contrast has been paid to the emergent market for natural history specimens and the clientels it produced. And so what I want to do really in the rest of the talk is to follow three types of bodies around collections, collectors and objects and show how, as it were, they all move into the revolutionary period, what kinds of meanings are attached to them, and how they transform, if at all, during that period. And we can look at the cycles of displacement, exchange, and sale within European collections uh, as a way of seeing how commercial considerations also underpinned uh, the connections between uh, collectors intermediaries and traders. So let's start with the collections. This is one of the very few representations of a public auction. And as you can see, this is actually an auction of works of art. But they were also very common methods of acquiring natural history specimens. So collectors were scavengers. They fed on the dead corpses of cabinets that had gone before. And as early as 1986, the famous French historian of natural history, Yves Lessu, flagged the importance of auction catalogues as sources for researching the history of 18th century natural history. But it's in fact only the recent uh, process of digitization of catalogues, which has happened extensively on two sites in particular, Gallica, which is the digitization site of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and um, the Bibliothèque of the um, Institut National de l'Histoire de l'Art, uh, that these sorts of materials have become widely available for people to use. And here's an example of the title page of one of them uh, referring to uh, the collection of a tax farmer. Um, now, there are lots of things one could say about this, but one of the things I want to emphasize here is the extent to which the catalogues underline how completely interpenetrated collecting in natural history and the fine arts actually was. Um, in a famous guide to European auction sales by Lucht, 
um, published in, started in the 1930s and continuing into the 1980s, um, uh, we can see kind of the changing fates of three different types of specimens, and the dates are along the bottom there. Um, I've compared paintings and prints and natural history. And at, at a glance, this tells us one important thing, namely that the standard story in uh, histories of natural history, that the natural history specimen market collapsed after about 1763 is complete rubbish, that in fact it only really takes off then and uh, isn't really interfered with or reduced much until the start of the Troubles in France in about 1786. And if we break down collectibles by <coughs> types of objects, uh, we can see what the line graph already tells us, that naturalia were a minor but persistent category in a larger phenomenon of tasteful collecting peaking in the 1780s. And this is actually by uh, frequency of appearance within collections. And you can see that natural history specimens are down here, so they're a small item. Um, paintings were the most common item overall, uh, and then we've got a whole range of other types of items, mostly up here with, with works of, of the fine arts. Um, and here we can see what happens if you take just natural history collections. This is from um, a, uh, an account of collections given by De, in Des Alliés d'Argentville's uh, his Natural History of Shells, published in 1780. Um, we can come back to this, but I just want to sort of flag for you the fact that um, there are certain sorts of collectibles that are particularly represented, notably and unsurprisingly, things like shells, minerals, and marine specimens. Again, we can use both Des Alliés d'Argentville and Luch to provide some sort of account of the comparative social status and see whether there are big differences between the types of people who collected. And the overriding thing to note here is that this was very much and overwhelmingly an elite activity. Uh, so the old regime elite of wealth and power, that is to say, princes, nobles, the clergy and financiers, uh, together account for over half the collections in total, 62.5% of all collections and 52.6% of just natural history collections. And these figures are all subject to a lot further refinement if I, as, as I manage to work through the catalogues. Um, and there, again, there are issues here that we could come back to about discrepancies, but um, I, I can't deal with them. So how did natural history, how did contemporaries understand natural history collections? What was their purpose at the end of the old regime? Well, collections feature in a widespread genre of literature that catered to tourists. And they were very much part of the culture of tourism. They appear in guidebooks, in almanacs. And here it becomes clear that the cabinet was a space where knowledge, visuality, and material culture combined through the union of specimens with a particular decor, architecture, and works of art, as Bettina Dietz has argued. And architects were sometimes commissioned to design cabinets of natural history, the most famous of these being uh, Courton's design for uh, the tax farmer Joseph Bonnier de la Maison's collection in the 1730s. But this was by no means something that died out with Bonnier de la Maison. Instead, if you look at the uh, cabinet of the School of Mines built in the mid-1780s under the supervision of the finance minister, Calon, the architect Antoine installed an octagonal gallery surmounting a room with Corinthian columns painted to look like yellow Sienese marble, walls decorated with gilding and sculpture, and two life-size Egyptian figures supporting the mantelpiece. And sadly, I have yet to find any good pictures of, of that. Um, but what I want to, the point I want to make is that the emphasis on scientific knowledge, didacticism, and classification that legitimated the school's existence as a collection was in no sense at odds with tasteful collecting. Its cabinet merely reflected newer trends towards neoclassical rather than Rococo styles, rather than a de-aestheticization of the natural history collection. 
So from all of this, we're starting to build up a slightly different picture of what the collection did in the late 18th century. Let me move on to collectors. And Bonnier de la Mosson is a, a useful übergangspunkt here. Um, because the compositional whole of the collection attested to the moral, social, and financial standing, taste, and intellect of the collector as an individual. And this was how Bonnier de la Mosson had himself painted in his collection. You can see the natural history specimens in the jars here along the wall. Um, he was actually quite unusual in having anatomical uh, specimens and, and specimens preserved in liqueur. This is a very high uh, cost, high la sort of labor intensive type of collecting that only the very wealthy could undertake. And then from a painting of a sort of idealized version of his cabinet, we can see something of what, you know, the degree, the level of ornamentation that was going on here. Um, now, in terms of how Naturalia figured within collections, uh, many notable collectors did have a separate room or space for Naturalia within their collections, but it's very probable, and this is something I want to follow up a good bit, um, that smaller collections might have included naturalia among other objects and alongside them. And this is a, the engraving that accompanied uh, one of Marmontel's Comte called Le Connoisseur. And if I give you just a close-up of that, I hope you can see that along the top here, there are shells and there are also marine specimens alongside a variety of other objects. But we shouldn't be led to think of these mixed collections as like the older Wunderkammer. In fact, this particular engraving represents a bad fictional collector who unconvincingly argued to his visitor, do not believe that the same disorder reigns in my head as in my cabinet. Everything is in its place there. The variety and even number of objects cast no confusion. So, I mean, the, the, the point here, of course, is that the, the books are all very randomly lying around on the shelves instead of neatly ordered. And I was actually thinking earlier on today how the reflexivity, uh, it, how much reflexivity is involved in the fact that our concerns today are so like those with which 18th century collectors grappled. I was very struck by Martin's comment about how formalization means selecting the world in an orderly way, leaving out the parts you don't like, because that is essentially exactly what the visual imagery of cabinets shows us for this, these later decades of the 18th century. Um, this is a headpiece to a poem in praise of one particular female collector, Madame de Courtagnon, um, and you can see that the collector within the cabinet is daydreaming of external nature on the right-hand side of the plate here. Um, but also she's operating upon it mentally because the items, the shells and so on that are sitting around are being ordered into the space of the home as parts of the decor here. So this is the shell collection in order. Um, and this very much captures the contemporary sense in which the French use the term cabinet as a liminal space between communion with the self and with others, a space between the social and the natural. And in fiction and non-fiction alike, the cabinet was the ultimate space for retreat or distance from worldly concerns. It was the generic term in domestic architecture for spaces of private worship, bodily functions, and dressing, so pre preparing one's public appearance before leaving the house. It was also the space of politics behind closed doors, escape from importunate lovers, novel reading, letter writing, the space where imagination could expand. So this is very much a space on the edge. In novels and guidebooks, it becomes clear that the cabinet, though almost always associated with one individual collector, was not necessarily a non-public space. There are numerous references to visiting collections in the owner's absence or to fixed opening hours, and travellers could find out where and when to visit from guidebooks or bookshops, which I think is very interesting. You go to a town, you go to the bookshop, they tell you what collections you can go and see and when. So it's this semi-personal, semi-public character that allowed collections to transition between personal and national property under the Republic. Collecting naturalia and art 
could successfully be represented as an act of public altruism by collectors, precisely by virtue of the semi-public status of the collection. At the same time, collections were about personal reputation and prestige. And these trends converged, for example, in the choice of the king's two brothers, the Duc d'Orléans and the Comte de Provence, to specialise in French minerals. And the latter donated a series of gold and silver ore samples sent to him by the director of the mine of Allemand in Dauphiné to the new school of mines. By the 1780s, there was intense interest in local series of specimens, particularly in mineralogy. The School of Mines contained intensive series arranged in two different ways, one representing the scale of nature and the other arranged um, by geographical origin. So you've got two competing kinds of system going on within, within one collection. Um, the key thing here being that the geographical layout allowed the collector to generate a microcosm of the nation's physical character. Opening cabinets to unknown polite visitors or compiling national series of specimens was something which earned collectors a reputation for personal patriotism and public spiritedness. But this transfer by nationalising the specimens also gave them a significant separate from the character of the collector as an individual. This meant that during the Republic, individual collectors could be prescribed without invalidating the patriotic and didactic function of collections in general. The Duc de la rochefoucauld liancourts natural history collection was mentioned in several guides. As president of the Comité d'Aliénation, which was the body that was charged to inventory specimens, he was probably the first to write instructions on how to preserve the objects confiscated by the government from the houses of emigrants. But when he too was prescribed after fleeing to England in 1792, the seals were placed on his collection and it was inventorized. So here's the top of this. Besides emigrants, the Republican reform of natural history also had a marked effect upon those who immediately before the revolution had profited from the role of natural history consultant, merchant or curator. In 1794, the naval commissioner, Denis-Jacques Fayol, wrote to the Commission Temporaire des Arts, complaining that he had been forced to cede his collection for, quote, a terrible price to the rapacity of Charles Capet, the former Comte d'Artois, who constituted him a pension which he has not been paid. The non-payment of the pension was almost entirely explicable because d'Artois had emigrated to Savoy in July 1789 with his entire household and was in absolutely no position to honour his debts. But Fayol was more fortunate than his patron. He was appointed the curator of the new Museum of Natural History attached to the Versailles Eco Centrale in 1795. So for someone like this, the Republic meant getting paid a salary to look after his own collection, which is a good deal if you can swing it. <laughs> and other commercial naturalists like the apothecary Valmont de Beaumard um, had a similar sort of experience. He was richly rewarded for organising the natural history collection of the Prince de Condé in his fabulous chateau at Chantilly near Paris. Condé went on to purchase de Beaumal's collection in 1787. And in 1791, this was actually the first collection to be inventorized by the state. So that's one way in which the state sort of took over and benefited from natural history commerce. But even for those who voluntarily offered their collection to the state as a Republican act, the depersonalization process that accompanied these transfers was difficult to stomach. The African traveller François Le Vaillant offered to sell his natural history collection to the nation in 1794. So commissioners from the Commission Temporaire des Arts were drafted in to inventorize and value the collection. And that autumn, Le Vaillant set his price, 60,000 livres, which is an enormous sum in this time of penury and Republican shortage. And in the light of this figure, the Commission Temporaire des Arts was, was requested to produce a more detailed inventory and estimate of all the, the collection specimens. But Le Vaillant repeatedly blocked the visit of the commissioners, Richard and Lamarck despite a formal letter from the commission inviting him to lift all the obstacles which might oppose 
inspection and examination, Le Vaillant persisted in his refusal to admit the men. And as he fumed recounting the incident in his Histoire naturelle des oiseaux in year seven, to estimate one by one the individuals of a collection which cost me 30 years of labor, including five years of rushing around the burning deserts of Africa. <laughs> and so as you can see, essentially the cabinet did not change hands, it did not become a Republican collection, um, and he there threatens in, in print to sell it to a foreigner so that it goes abroad. Now the interesting thing here is that there are an awful lot of people trying to get state funding for the practice of natural history. Levi was in a very com competitive market um, to be in position where he might have been about to receive this very large sum of money uh, seems a bit surprising. Um, but the gripe seems to have been that uh, the collection as a whole served Le Vaillant's self-representation as intrepid traveller. But the state administrators were adopting what you might call an auction view of the collection, breaking it down into its constituent parts rather than a heroic view. And in so doing, they completed the severing of the meaning of the collection from the meaning of the collector. And I just want to end with two categories of objects that are interesting to consider because they figured so largely in pre-revolutionary literature on collections. The first is what I think of as boundary breaching objects. Although the concern in, in collections was about classifying and order, there was a particular attention to items that breached the boundaries, to things that slipped between forms, like figured stones, carved gems, fossilized plants. And these often related to personifications of nature as an imperfect executrix of the plans of the creator. The design of natural productions was evaluated alongside that of human productions and in the same way. And the artistic ideal of belle nature made items where human skill had complemented and perfected natural creativity particularly collectible. And this includes natural objects or substances that were worked or adorned in some way. So the dendritic agate here, for example, is uh, a substance that was collectible in its own right and it would sit alongside um, the worked up objects, in this case by the jeweler Dreis. So what you tend to get is a, a kind of fusion object in which art and natural history converged. And this famously is the Teschen table, recently acquired by the de Breteuil, uh, from the de Breteuil family for the Louvre by a national fund. Now what's perhaps not very visible from the back here is that uh, each of these tiny little inlays is accompanied by a number. And that number relates to a natural history guide uh, which identifies the mineral and basically positions this therefore as a kind of collection in its own right. Um, and it's this kind of object which is, was at once very collectible but also very much under threat. And Lamarck in 1791 commented adversely on that type of object as basically being a feature of the cabinet of curiosity rather than the cabinet of natural history. This has been taken to mean by many historians of science that this was an, an attempt to exclude aesthetics from the collection as a whole, that there should be no criteria of beauty. But actually, if we look at the ways in which uh, the commissioners themselves, of whom Lamarck was one, made use of the specimens when they uh, reprocessed them for sending out to the École Centrale, we find that that is not the case. Um, in fact, what happened was that the specimens were uh, sent out because they were beautiful, so you still get collections of shells being sent out to the individual provinces for the new collections. The second issue I want to address very briefly is exceptionalism, because here is a case of something which has been seen to be excluded from 18th century collections uh, going towards the 19th century, but in fact we find that it continues to a very great extent. Um, on the left hand side here, uh, right at the top, lot number one, is actually a levorotatory specimen of Helix pomatia, a very common species, obviously, but it's rotating in the wrong direction, to the left instead of to the right. 
And you also get a lot of attention to things like exceptional colouring or shine, ex exceptional completeness of fragile specimens. Now, for auctioneers to know about rarity like this required them to be familiar with a lot of collections and to know what was standard and what items could be seen to be a departure from the norm. Um, and we might imagine that the Republican commissioners charged with inventorising the confiscated émigré collections would have used the occasion to impose a compute, completely new interpretative system on the objects they perused. Well, in one sense, that's true. If we go back to this, you can see that they were using Linnaean names, which is not what shell collectors in the late old regime were using, or very rarely. But in terms of the choice of objects... Um, the system of identifying the individual objects within the confiscated collections uh, as produced in a printed pamphlet of instructions of year two uh, specifically identified them by a set of crosses. One cross signified was that, uh, that the object is remarkable by its characteristics or by its fine preservation and that it can serve in teaching. Two crosses denoted rare, precious, and very remarkable objects. And three crosses were to be applied to the rarest and most precious objects. And I just found, going through this, I'm sorry this is such... Uh, it's not very easy to see, but if you look down the left-hand side here, there's a system of crosses being utilised in some cases and not in others. So this singling out of, nat for, of naturalia for protection by the state on the basis of their rarity shows more continuity with the priorities of old regime collecting than we might expect. And it also implies that the Republic's commissioners, naturalists like, like Lamarck or Richard, needed to possess the same kind of knowledge as collectors, auctioneers and guidebook writers, namely knowledge about value and rarity about what items in a collection the viewer should particularly remark. The standing of naturalists outside institutions like this, that is to say most of the elite private collectors who'd wealth had depended on old regime structures, suffered lasting damage from the Republican reorganisation of natural history. Even after the survivors returned, the institution continued to occupy the commanding position in natural history. Personal collections would never again dominate the discipline to the extent that they had during the 1760s to 1780s. But the inventorising process did not completely destroy the system of standards by which individual specimens were assessed and valued. Beauty, rarity and provenance remained high priorities in the Republican reallocation. And I can't resist letting the Germans have the last word because as the confiscated monuments were trundling from Rome to Paris, Pope Pius VI was similarly being shunted around Europe as a French captive. And as Lichtenberg put it in a letter of 1798, Pius der Letzte ausgestopft oder ein Spiritus Vini wäre doch ein größeres Kabinettstück. Thank you.